Okay, there's a, din- there's a diner in New Orleans that advertises that it will serve you anything you want, and if they cannot serve you what you want, they will write you a check for $5,000 as an apology. So a man's passing by this diner, and he sees this message advertised at the entrance. He thinks it's probably a scam, so he decides to go in and give it a try. As he enters the diner, a waitress seats him at the table. She asks the man, what can I get you, sir? The man thinks for a moment, and he says, how about an elephant's ear and a muffin? The waitress replies, you bet. I'll be right back with your order. The waitress heads back to the kitchen. After waiting about 20 minutes, the man begins to think that this is going to be an easy $5,000. There's no way they've got an elephant's ear. At the same moment, the waitress returns. Appearing a little anxious, the the waitress asks him, I'm sorry, sir, but would you mind telling me what kind of elephant you want this ear from? The man's kind of stunned. He says, I don't know, what about an African elephant? The waitress says, okay, thank you, sir, and she heads back to the kitchen. Not a minute later, the waitress returns again. She said, I'm sorry, sir, but would you like the left or the right ear? The man's starting to become a little nervous at this point. He says, "Um, I guess the left ear? Thank you, sir, and she returns to the kitchen. So he's starting to get nervous because he's wondering, he's starting to think they've got an elephant ear, and he goes, I have no clue how much an elephant ear is going to cost me. So a few minutes later, the waitress returns with a platter of food and a $5,000 check. The waitress tells the man, here's your order, sir. Please accept this check as our, for our apologies. Unfortunately, we're all out of muffins today. <laughs> There you go. Your joke of the week. You might be asking, what does it have to do with the message? Absolutely nothing. That's just a bonus for being here today. (laughs) All right, let's get started. It's the highlight of your week, I know. Today we're going to conclude the series that we've been on for the past uh, several weeks, Um, the series that we're in called Forward. We have walked through the mission for the last six weeks, the mission and the vision of the church and how it applies to you individually. And today we're going to close this out, not by talking so much about the vision of the church, but rather talking about personal vision and how having the correct personal vision for your life is vital, how this affects everything of your life, having vision for your life. Next week, don't miss next week, my wife and I are going to be teaming up and doing a four-part marriage series called For Better or For Worse. We really feel like there's been an increased attack on marriages as of late, and so we both really feel like this this sermon series is going to be timely. She's going to do two of them, I'm going to preach two of them, and we're just going to bring some some real-life examples of what we've learned over the years, and and just try to give, give you what you can to help you out. So if you know of someone that's going through some marriage difficulty starting next week, make sure that you invite them. But this morning, I believe I've got a truth that will literally change your life forever. This is one of those truths from the Word of God that I have applied to my life, and the impact and the change has been phenomenal in my life. For me, this is the one truth that has been the difference for me between a life of happiness or sadness, peace, living in peace, or living in stress in my life. Some have asked me, Pastor, how do you stay positive all of the time? I mean, you go through the same junk we all go through. You had a tough upbringing filled with abuse and different stuff like that. It would be easy for you to be a bitter person, but you're not. Why? Why are you not a bitter bitter person? And I'm going to tell you why this morning. I'm going to give you the secret that I have learned. The truth is I'm not positive all the time. Just ask my family. Actually, don't ask them, but um, I'm not positive all the time. I have my days just like everybody else. But when I don't and when I struggle, it's usually because, not all the time, but I'd say 98% of the time, it's because I am neglecting this one truth from the Word of God that I'm going to teach you here today. So just because I'm preaching it doesn't mean I live it all the time. I have to work on this just like we all do. So let's get started. We're going to read two verses to start today from Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 17. I'm actually going to read from the King James Version today, which I don't typically do, but I'm going to do this because I really like the way these two verses are translated in the King James Version. So here we go. Proverbs chapter 29, verses 17 and 18, here's what it says. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. 
Verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I'm calling this message this morning, the power of a changed vision. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ. I pray, Father, that you would help me to communicate this great truth in the way that you want it communicated, God. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, that you would go forward, forward with these words, that they would not fall upon deaf ears. Because, God, if you don't anoint this message today, this message will fall flat. It'll be a no good. But, God, if you anoint these words, it has the power to change lives. So we thank you in advance for the work that you're about to do in this place through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the word vision is defined as the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. A vision is how you see yourself in the future. I taught kids for 17 years as a children's pastor, and one of my favorite things to ask kids was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I loved hearing the responses, responses like, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a football player, I want to be a veterinarian, and the list goes on and on and on. You see, as a child, we have vision for our lives. Even the kids that come from horrible life situation, there seems to be a vision in the heart of every child. But then I have watched people as they grow, they begin to lose the vision, Life circumstances, oftentimes out of their control, knock them down to the point where they lose hope, they lose faith, they lose vision. And they wander through life just trying to scrape by and make it through the day. Some of them even self-medicate with drugs and alcohol just to cope, but they lose vision for their life. And maybe you're in here this morning and you feel like I'm describing you. You once had a great vision for your life, but now you feel like your vision is dead. Here in Proverbs chapter 29, we're read that we are to correct our children. And then the very next verse says, without vision, people perish. Now at first glance, it seems very strange to have these two verses together like this. It almost seems as if they're polar opposites, but there is a great truth here that is uncovered when you combine these two short verses together. You see, what the writer of Proverbs is trying to say is that when you correct your children, there is a vision that you have when correcting your children. The vision is for your children to grow up and not make decisions that will destroy them. So because you have a vision for their life, a vision for them to succeed, you correct them. Even if you're tired, even if you're worn out, you correct them because of your vision. If you have no vision for your children, they'll oftentimes do whatever they want. They'll make decisions that will ultimately destroy their life. Without vision, people perish. Vision is a powerful thing. When our kids were little, and I've told you this before, Case in point, we had a vision to raise them to serve people. We took them everywhere with us. They rode our buses every week. They went out on the visitations every week. They witnessed all of the fights and all of the cursings. They were just, all, the, all the people cursing. They were just little kids, and they walked right through the middle of all of this. And I struggled with that to a point. But we had a vision. In Colorado, when we dealt with all of the gang problems, they were there. I remember in Colorado one night, I had a fight break out on my bus, and one kid took the other kid and slammed his head into the side bus window so hard, it broke the bus window. Now, if you know how hard it's, you got to hit a bus window to break it. <laughs> if you're on the bus, please do not try it this morning. Thank you. But my kids seen it all. You see, we had a vision for our kids. We want you to grow up, and we want you to serve people. We didn't want them to grow up with a fear of serving people when it got tough, because anybody can sit in a Bible study and sing Kumbaya and love the people around you, but it's much harder to love somebody that's, that's using pro profanities to your face. That's hard. That's what we wanted them to see. So we didn't want to shelter them. We put them right in the middle of it. 
I didn't know if I was making the right decision. But I look at them today, and I'm so proud of them. All three of my children are serving the Lord. All three of them are serving others. Two of them right now are serving on Wednesday nights. They don't have to do that. They're, they're at the age now where I take off the belt and I say, you don't go to church, I'm going to whip you. They look at me and laugh. It's their choice. And they come and they serve the Lord on their own accord. And I've heard the horror stories of other pastor's kids that have grown up and they completely rebel. They want nothing to do with God. And I think, man, we have been so blessed But we had a vision for our kids. Are they perfect? No. Have we had issues? Yes. But I am so proud of all of my children. With that in mind, remember vision is described, is defined as the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. So basically your vision will be driven by what you choose to think about. For for instance, I'm going to use this as an example because I think most of us can probably relate to this. There are times that I struggle with worry and anxiety. Any of you ever have anxiety? Any of you ever worry? Even though the Word of God, I know what the Word of God says, do not worry about anything. (laughs) I do, I struggle with it. But here's what I've discovered. There's times I get fearful. Here's what I've discovered. When I'm worried, when I'm struggling with anxiety, when I'm struggling with fear, It's because in my mind, I have a vision of things going wrong. I am convinced that things are going to go wrong, and so that's what I'm thinking about. And this is why Jesus says, fear not. This is why the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then, then... After you do that, you will experience God's what? Peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Basically, change your vision. Change how you think. Some of us are stuck in a rut and we can't break free because we constantly see ourselves as a failure. This is the image that consumes our thoughts. This is the vision of who we are. Some of us are in a miserable marriage right now. When you're first married, we have a vision of what our marriage should look like. We always do. Nobody is married and says, I'm just going to have a miserable marriage. Nobody says that. You have a vision of what your marriage is going to look like. But over time, things don't go as planned. They never do. That's life, and what happens? We begin to lose the vision we once had, and we start to think about how miserable our marriage is instead of thinking about how it could be and what we need to change to get there, and we give up and we walk away. In my marriage, you're going to hear more about this in the marriage series we have coming up. There have been numerous times both of us just about walked away. You see, when our focus, when our thoughts were on everything that's going wrong, we were miserable. There's always going to be stuff wrong. Always. But when we changed our mindset, when we changed our vision to how our marriage could be, what our marriage could look like, and we focused on the things going right, we were able to make it through. You have to change your vision. This truth will change your life. I guarantee it. This is a powerful truth from the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 15. I'm going to read three different verses from Deuteronomy. Here we go. Deuteronomy 15, 15. Remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord God redeemed you. Deuteronomy 16, 12. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, so be careful to to obey all these decrees. Deuteronomy 24, 18. Always remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord God, and the Lord your God redeemed you from your slavery. Three different scriptures, and there's one word that's repeated. The word is remember. If you read the word of God, you'll quickly see this word pop up over and over again. Even when we take communion like we did just a, just a few moments ago, we are to, Jesus tells us to do so in remembrance of him. 
Over and over we are commanded to remember, but not just to remember anything. God also tells us what we are to remember. Just the fact that God is specific in telling us what we are to remember tells me that there are things in life that he does not want me to remember. There are things in life he doesn't want me to think about. There are things in life that he does not want me to dwell on. And you might be saying, but that's impossible. I can't choose what I remember. I, I, and I understand that thought, but God never commands us to do anything that we cannot choose to will or do. For instance, God tells us to rejoice. That means I can, be, I can decide to be happy because God commanded that, but it's my choice. God also said be content. So what does that mean? That means I can decide to be content because God commands me to be content with what I have. Some people are miserable because they choose to be miserable. People that walk around and they say, man, woe is me. My life is in the pits. I hate my life. Well, there it goes again. That's just the story of my life. You have to change your vision. That kind of thinking is a choice, and I'm going to prove it to you. It doesn't mean it's easy to live this, choi- this, this truth. And like I said earlier, I don't always get this right. But we can change this if we decide to make a change. I'm going to say it again. God never commands us to do anything that we cannot decide or choose to do. So when God says remember, and he tells us what to remember, that means we can decide what to remember or what to think about. Think of it like this. On my desk, I have a computer. On the hard drive of that computer, there's hundreds and thousands of files. I choose what I want displayed on the screen by double-clicking the icon or whatever it is. I choose that. I make the choice to open the file and display whatever is on that document on my computer screen. Everything that has happened in your life is stored on the computer, which is your mind. Every word that you've ever heard is in your mind. Every event from your childhood right up to the present day stored in your mind. Some things are easier to remember than others, but it's stored there. Every reaction you had to every deed, good or bad, is in your mind. Just like with your computer, with all that stuff in your mind, you have the choice as to what files you want to see or what you want to think about. You see, it's up to you whether you want to admit it or not. This is your choice. Even though you cannot control the things that happen to you, you can control what you bring up on the screen or what you think about. With this in mind, there are things that God tells us to think about or remember, and there are things that God tells us to forget or simply put, in other words, not to think about. There are things God does not want us to bring up on the computer screens of our life, and if you do, if you bring these things up on the computer screen of your life, and you think about them, you will struggle. And that's why God tells you don't do that. Now, each of us have had bad things happen in our life. Nobody in here is exempt from that. We've all had bad things that we can remember if we choose to. I'm sure you could probably list them out because those seem easier to remember than anything. But you see, it's the remembrance of these things that will make us very, very bitter. I want you to know that if you are bitter today, you have chosen to be bitter. Now, you might say, now, wait a minute. I didn't, I, I didn't decide to be bitter. You don't understand my situation, Pastor. And the thing is, believe it or not, I do understand because we all have stuff to deal with. We all have situations in life that didn't turn out like we hoped they would. So I understand even though you might not have decided to be bitter, You have decided to push the button on the keypad of your computer that keeps bringing up the images of the past, which will, in turn, make you bitter. You have to change your vision. Likewise, if you have joy, it's because you've chosen to have joy. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. We are commanded to be full of the joy of the Lord and to rejoice. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16, always be joyful. It's a command. We're commanded to be joyful. There are things inside of your mind that have the power to make you bitter. And there are things inside of your mind that have the power to make you happy and to make you joyful. In my mind, there are things that are stored up 
that make me want to praise God and shout the glory of God. And then there are things that I can bring up that will make me feel anger and bitterness. And it's my choice what I dwell on. And God has said, I want you to remember certain things. We all have reasons to be bitter at someone or something. And if you remember those negative things, if you're constantly thinking about and talking about those negative things, guess what? You will be bitter. You will be bitter. But we also have things in our life to be grateful and to rejoice. And if you choose to think of those things and remember those things, you will be joyful. You see, your disposition is up to you and you alone. Nobody can change my disposition, my outlook on life. None of you can do that to me. That's all on me. You choose by your will to remember the bad things, to remember the bitter things, the negative things, the unhappy things, the sad things, or you can choose to remember what God says to remember, things that make you grateful, things that make you joyful, things that make you want to shout hallelujah. I'm trying to tell you the difference between the happy people and the unhappy people, the difference between the negative people and the positive people. It's not their circumstance. I'm going to say that again. It's not their circumstance. There's a difference because their vision is different. I know people that have been dealt a very sour hand in life, but yet they're the most positive people I've met. On the flip side, I know people that have done very well in life, and they have everything you could ever want, but they're miserable. It's what they're putting on the computer screen of their life. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, watch this. This is good. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Watch. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You see, God tells us what to remember. Remember things that are true. Remember things that are honorable. Remember things that are right. Things that are pure, lovely. Remember things that are excellent and they're worthy of praise. God says, that is what I want you to focus on. And I know friendships that have been destroyed because one person offended the other and that one person just refuses to let it go. A friendship of 20 years destroyed over one mistake. I've seen it with my own eyes. You see, because instead of remembering all of the years of good, remembering all of the times that the friend was right there by their side through the good and through the bad, they chose instead to keep bringing the offense to remembrance. The marriages that have been torn apart because instead of remembering the good, we instead remember the bad. And I've heard women say, he just doesn't meet my needs. And you see, what they're doing is they're remembering all the times. Maybe he worked late or he missed a date. What if instead they chose to remember something else? What if instead they remembered the the times of him working so hard to the point of exhaustion to ensure the family had food to eat or a roof over their head? And I've had men say to me, my wife just doesn't touch me anymore. She doesn't show me any affection. What if instead they chose to remember the times that she went to bed absolutely exhausted because she had to deal with the little kids all day? The time she cooked a wonderful meal for the family and cleaned the house. You see, we all have a choice of what image we're going to throw up on the screen. The couples that make it the most, the, the, the longest, the couples that survive will tell you, they'll all tell you, and I'll say this as well, one of the biggest reasons they made it was because they chose to remember the good and not dwell on the bad. They had a different vision for their marriage. The same thing's true of the church. If you're here long enough, there's going to be decisions that are going to be made that you don't agree with. (laughs) I have to make hundreds, thousands of decisions over the course of a year, some of them them very quickly. I'm just going to be honest with you. Sometimes after I make the decision, I don't even like the decision. That happened a lot in COVID. I'd make a decision and say, boy, I don't even know if this is right, but here we go. (laughs) And the same is true of other ministry leaders, thousands of decisions they have to make. And church, church people... We'll often say things to make you mad. Offense is eventually going to come knocking at your door. 
from someone or something, I guarantee it. But you can choose to remember the offense and allow a root of bitterness to develop, or you can instead choose to remember all of the good. You can remember all of the souls that have been added to the kingdom. You can remember the people that we have fed and that we have clothed. You can remember all of the changed lives. You can remember all the times the word of God was preached over your life to help you walk closer to God. That's what you can remember. A while back, one of the sweet ladies that rides our bus on a Sunday morning wrote me a letter telling me how much she loves this church and how much the people here in this church mean to her. She said her life was a mess before she started coming, but by the grace of God, she's been completely restored. She said, for the first time in a long time, Pastor, I have hope again, and I feel like I have found my home. She says she feels like this is her family. You see, it's things like this that I choose to remember. I keep notes like that. I cherish notes like that. People that speak ill against me, people that that don't like me, I'm not going to think about that, and that happens as well. I'm not going to remember that. Instead, I'm going to remember the good. I'm going to remember the positive. You see, I have a choice. I can remember all of the arguments my wife and I have had because she's been wrong a lot, of course. (laughs) I can choose to remember that. There she goes again. She'll get her revenge, trust me. Or I can remember all of the walks together. I can remember all the laughs and the smiles we've had together. I can remember the, I can remember the times the kids made me so mad that I want to push them down the, out of the car going down the highway. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. You've thought about it too if you've got small kids. If not, get ready. Your time's coming. I can remember that or I can remember the times I held them in my arms and they told me how much they loved me. I can remember the times, I remember the time Jace was just a little, little guy, he'd, we'd go home after, after church service on Sunday and he'd lay his little head on my chest and he'd nap right on my chest. He won't do that anymore, I try to get him to do that now and he, <laughs> he won't do that anymore, I don't know what's going on. Jace, maybe today, he's like, <laughs> he's like I'm leaving if you, don't, if you don't quit. But I can remember certain leaders I've served under, certain and they made ministry decisions, because this has happened. I've served under leaders, and they made ministry decisions I didn't like. Or maybe ministry decisions that hurt me. I can remember that, or I can choose to remember the thousands of tears they cried for me in prayer and the times that they encouraged me. You see, many people miss out on the blessings of God because of one little offense, and they keep bringing that same offense up on the computer screen. I want you to know that when God delivered the Israelites out of the hands of the Egyptians, it was one of the greatest miracles in the Old Testament. They were slaves. God sent a man named Moses, and after a series of events, the people of Israel finally were free. We see then God part the waters of the sea. People walk across on dry ground. We've seen water come out of a rock. We've seen food mysteriously come from heaven to feed everyone. Miracle after miracle they witnessed, and we read about these today as they made their way to the promised land. You'd think they'd be grateful. You'd think they would be in constant praise because now they're free and they're seeing all of the miracles of God, but instead, what do we see they do over and over and over again? They complain. Hey, Moses, we need some water. Did you bring us out here to die, Moses? Moses, we're sick of eating the same old thing. How about some meat? Moses, we have blisters on our feet. How much further we got, Moses? Who made you boss anyway, Moses? Hey, Moses, we want to go back. It would have been better for us to stay slaves in Egypt. Moses, if they had Uber back then, Moses would have been probably calling one. It would have been a camel pulling up with an Uber sticker on it. (laughs) Oh, I'm getting off track here. Here we go. God finally gets sick of it. He gets sick of the whining and he says, enough. You see, they were remembering the wrong things. They needed to change their vision. God sets them straight and he tells them exactly what they are to remember. He tells them what they should be putting on the computer screen of their mind. He tells them to remember the fact that they are once slaves, but now they are free. Listen, here's what I do, and I encourage you to do this as well. This is good advice. This is such good advice, I might have to take a second offering. So just get ready. When I, when I get down, some of you are thinking about leaving right now because I'm taking a second offering. When I start to get down, when I get anxious, maybe afraid, I start throwing myself a little pity party. Woe is me, poor Matt. I do that sometimes. 
the word remember comes to my mind. And I'll either take out a piece of paper or I'll just start going through this in my mind. And I start listing all of the things that I'm thankful for. Things like, you know what, I'm thankful that my children are healthy. I'm thankful that my spouse, my wife is healthy. I'm thankful I have a warm home. I'm thankful I have food to eat. And I just think of the, start thinking of the blessings of God. You see, because some people don't have healthy kids. Some people don't have a healthy spouse. Some people have lost their spouse. Some people don't have a warm home to sleep in. And some people don't know where their next meal is coming from. You see, what am I doing? I'm changing my vision. I'm changing my vision, and I'm choosing to remember what God instructs me to remember. But here's the biggest one. I write down, and I try to remember this. I am a child of God. And rem- I'm telling you, remembering this one thing alone changes everything. I say my name is written in the book of life. Heaven is my home. I have been set free. This is what I remember. And I think of the scripture found in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 6. says, but I came by and I saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. And as you lay there, I said, Live. And that's what God did for me. I was dead in my sin, a wretched, pitiful man, thinking, how could God ever forgive a sinner like me? I was laying there, kicking around in my own blood, my own filth, so to speak, the filth of my sin, and God looked down on me, looked at my mess, and he spoke one word to me. He said, live. And God is speaking the same thing to you today. Live. Live. You see, it is the remembrance of this one truth, the truth that God has set me free that allows me to remember the the fact that even though people might hurt me, even though people might wrong me, I have done the very same thing to God, but he chose not to remember it. God sets the example for us. Don't believe me? Look at Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. He says, and I will forgive their wickedness And I will never again remember their sins. Now think about this. Do you think that when you accept Christ as your Savior that God instantly gets an amnesia and forgets everything you've ever done? You accept Christ as your Savior and the next day he looks at you and says, you know what? Yesterday you really did something to tick me off, but for the life of me I can't remember what it is. You think that's what happens? Of course not. Everything is still there, but you see, he chooses not to remember all of the junk. Instead, he chooses to remember the moment when you said, I am a sinner, God forgive me. He remembers the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord. So when he looks at you, that is what he sees. It's called selective memory. You see, when I think of my mother, who's been gone more than 10 years now, I could bring up the memory of the time she got so angry at me, she grabbed the back of my head and she slammed my face into the carpet, bloody in my nose. I could remember all the times she did drugs in front of me. I could remember all of the men she brought in in that little tiny apartment we lived in night after night. I have all of those memories. I can go to the computer in my mind and hit the key on the keyboard and I can bring these things up and I can stew on them and I can remember them, but I choose not to. Instead, when I think of my mother, I think of the times we, have, we had no food and she went without food so her little boy would have something to eat. I remember one time she had two measly dollars to her name. We were at a store in the mall and there was this little pathetic little toy that I wanted really, really bad. I didn't throw a fit. I said, boy, I'd really like to have that. And I watched her pick that thing up off the shelf and she spent her last two dollars on a silly little toy to see a smile on her, on her son's face. When I think of my dad, I could bring up the memories, all the memories of the times that he never showed up. And I've told you these stories for weekend visits. I could bring up the memories of me thinking, why doesn't my own dad want me? Why doesn't my own dad love me? What's wrong with me? But I choose not to. Instead, I choose to remember the times that he took me to the gas station on the weekends that he did pick me up. He took me to the gas station and he would buy me a little chocolate milk and some of those white powdered donuts. And we'd go out and visit Grandpa. 
Then I think of the man my mother was married to for several years. I was just a little boy. I could bring up the memory of him coming home drunk and beating her so badly that she had trouble getting out of, getting out of bed the next day. I can remember the time he threw hot baking grease on her, burning the whole side of her face and, the, and, and her arm. I could remember him hitting her one time, and I got so mad that I ran up to him and kicked him right in the shin. I'm just a little guy. He took off his belt and beat me with it. I could, I could remember that. It's, it's still there, but I choose not to. I could remember all the times my mother screamed as he kicked her as she laid helplessly on the floor, bleeding. Instead, I choose to remember the times that he took me into the backyard and he played catch with me. I choose to remember him taking me hunting one time and telling me he was proud of me because I noticed a squirrel up in the tree above us and he, he shot it, giving us a meal for that day. We, we were so hungry, we did anything, even squirrels out of the tree. I choose to remember... As, a, as I was an adult, him walking up to me years ago and apologizing to me for the way he treated my mother and asking me with tears in his eyes to forgive him. You see, I remember everything he did, but I choose not to dwell on it. I've made a decision to remember the good times and not the bads. And if he walked in here today, I would embrace him. He'd sit on the front row with my family. No hard feelings whatsoever. And I can say that with all honesty. You see, I remember everything. Everything's a part of my story, but that's all they are. Those are the memories. They don't define me. I choose the memories to dwell on. Sam, I'm going to have you go ahead and come on up if you could at this time. Many people have asked me when they hear this story, especially with that guy that beat my mother like that, he said, you know, how, how can you do that? Everything that that man did to your mother, how could you forgive him? How can you just let that go? And I'm going to tell you how it's possible. It's possible because I choose to remember something very important. The same thing that God told the Israelites to remember. He told them to remember that you guys were slaves and I delivered you. And I remember the day that God walked by me and there I was, sitting in my own blood, my sin, my filth, and my wickedness, guilty, full of sin, full of wickedness. And instead of ignoring me and passing me by, he looked at me, and he gave me new life by speaking one word, live. It's the remembrance that I have been set free. It's the remembrance that because I have been forgiven of such a great offense, I am now able to forgive. This one thing will change your life. Maybe today it's time to change your vision. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I believe that you are moving in this place right now. And I believe, God, that you are speaking to people right where they're at that you are revealing areas of their life that they need to change their vision. For some of them, it's their marriage. They need to change their vision. For some of them, it's the vision they have of their children. They need to change their vision. For some, it's the vision they have of themselves. And life has beat them down so much that they feel like they've given up. Life has dealt them a hand that they didn't anticipate, and because of that, they lost the vision. And today, God, I believe that you are rebirthing that within them. God, you've never once given up on anyone in this room, anyone watching, God. And so today, I thank you. Holy Spirit, do your work in this place. Do your work in this place, God. In Jesus' name, I want you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed.